Good morning. Yeah. Good to see you guys. We're excited to worship God today. We're excited to worship with you guys. Let's all stand together.
slain for us, you alone were here. And the praise is yours, and the praise is yours, and the one we bow before, reigning over us as we let you.
to Gaius. One was kind of a pass-through. Gaius reads 2 John to the church. But in this process, John knew that there was some opposition that might arise. And so he wrote the letter of 3 John to encourage Gaius because he foresaw that another church leader named Diotrephes would not receive this letter well and might make a fuss about it. John was intuitive about this and said, Gaius, be brave, be courageous, stand for the truth. Um, He says this whole letter basically to encourage him in this process. And the issues in this church were apparently so bad that John planned to come himself to sort things out and also to put Diotrephes in his place. But John couldn't come yet for some reason. We don't know why. So in the meantime, he wrote this letter. So there you go. Clear as mud. Hopefully that diagram helps a little bit. The main thing is that it's a letter from John to an individual named Gaius. And that's kind of unique because uh, it's a personal correspondence between two people. Many of the letters in the New Testament are from uh, an an individual to a church. And this is to another individual. So we really get a peep in on somebody's mail here this morning that the Holy Spirit inspired and then also preserved for our benefit. There's one other group of people involved, and I'll just mention them here. John says that some believers from this church had come and visited John and told him how great Gaius was doing. They reported that Gaius was faithful to the truth, that he continues to walk in the truth, and that he has helped some sort of group of traveling missionaries that John calls brothers and sisters, is this term for him. This visit from these believers to John and their reports about Diotrephes and Gaius and the church is what prompted John to write 2 John and 3 John in the the first place. All right, do you guys follow me and all that? Mostly got it? All right, maybe a little bit. I didn't see many nodding heads there. We're pretty lost. That's okay. Norman, please come on up and read for us the letter of 3 John. And then we'll talk about what it means for us. Okay, there we go. Elder unto the beloved Gaius, whom I beloved in truth. Beloved, I wish all things that thou mayest prosper in, in in health, even though thou so prosper. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Beloved, thou faithfully forward thou thy both be brethren to strangers. Who have borne witness of the charity before the church, whom I bring forward on their journey as their goodly sort, and do and shall do well. Because on name's sake they went forth, making and taking nothing of the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow help, fellow helpers to the church and the church and I excuse me, I wrote into the sort of a this is the word of Diotrephes. Diotrephes. Yeah. Who loveth to have the prominence among us, receiveth us not. Therefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, and he doeth prating against us with malicious words, and not contend. Therefore, neither not he himself receive the brethren, and forbidden them that, that they would, and cast them out of the church. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but do which is good. He that doeth good is with God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Demetrius had good report of all men and the truth itself, yet we will hear <coughs> also hear record, and you know that their record is true. I have many things to write, but I will not walk write with ink and can write unto thee. But I trust I shall shortly see thee. And we shall speak face to face. Peace be to thee, our friends. Salute thee. Greet thy friends by name. Awesome. Thank you, Norman. 
appreciate you reading the whole book of the Bible for us. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> cool. All right. There are three messages that the letter of Third John has for us. And the first one is prioritize your spiritual health. In the first paragraph that we read, that Norman read, John says that he hopes that uh, Gaius has good physical health. But then he goes on, and, and we see it even more important to him, is that Gaius has good spiritual health. Physical health is very important, and in many ways, it's an indicator of our spiritual health. They're very tied, like we should honor God with our bodies, we should try to be healthy. But the overarching umbrella, and, and I guess more important than our physical health, is our spiritual health. So I want to do a little check-in and have all of you just take a, a deep breath, maybe right now, and a, a self-assessment. How is your spiritual health. How is your soul doing? Do you have anxiety? Give it to God. Are you harboring any bitterness in your heart? Release that and give it to the Lord. Are you holding on to unforgiveness? Ask God to help you take steps towards forgiveness, to set you free. Do you feel tired, stressed, or overworked? If so, take a Sabbath. Rest with God. Do you have some concerning symptoms, but you can't quite put a finger on why your soul feels unsettled? Schedule an appointment with a good physician. Get a diagnosis. Have you felt selfish lately or egocentric? Or huddled up around your own hurts and or desires or pain, talk to the good counselor so that you can get healing in your soul. There are so many ways we can focus on our physical health in our world. Growing up uh, a child of the 90s, I feel like just in that decade alone, in those 10 years, there were probably 10,000 different diets that came out. There are so many health fads. There are so many books and um, rumors. I mean, there's so much out there. And, and I don't know about you, but I pay quite a bit of attention to my physical health. I try not to follow a lot of fads, but I do try. And, uh, and I've got thoughts, and I'm sure I could talk with you, and, and you'd say, no, your thoughts are pretty wrong. You should be eating more avocados. Or, I don't know, whatever your thing is, you know. All of us have, like, we pay attention to our physical health because it impacts us every day. And I would just challenge us, as much as we pay attention to our physical health, pay even more attention to your spiritual health. And as, what's, what's great, though, about spiritual health is um, there's not competing messages out there for us who are believers. Like, for physical health, we, we might get all sorts of conflicting advice, especially if we were going to ask the CDC. Uh, they would tell us one thing very strongly and then go completely against that the next month. Like, there are lots of different competing ideas of how to stay physically healthy, but for believers, we are, we've got to be grateful. There is just one book that we need to tell us how to be spiritually healthy. That's the Bible. All right? You only need one cookbook for your spiritual health. If you follow the recipes in there, you're going to be fine. Some signs of good spiritual health that John alludes to are faithfulness and an outward focus on helping others. And some signs of poor spiritual health that John alludes to are flakiness and an inward focus on helping yourself. Maybe because you're hurt, or maybe because, as, as Diotrephes did, maybe you love to be first. We need to continually exercise our muscles by, by putting others first. We need to get outside of ourselves and like go for a walk, if you will. Like Get out. And exercise that muscle of putting others first, because that is 
good for our spiritual health to serve others. Um, when we prioritize our spiritual health, it's good for us and it's good for others. About five years ago, I, I read a health book, and I think it was the last health book I read, and maybe the only health book I've ever read. It was called Winning My Race, and in it, the author suggested that, uh, that each of us needs to find our why. That was his big emphasis in the book, is find your why, which is like, why do you want to be physically healthy? And so I wrote on a post-it note, you know, so I can be there for my kids and my grandkids my future grandkids. I don't have them any yet, but, um, but I'm looking ahead thinking I want to be healthy when I'm old and, and so I need to make good decisions now. So I put that little post-it note on my mirror and, uh, and you've probably thought along those lines before as well, like you want to be healthy for the long run because our health, our physical health impacts people around us because if we're dead, we're not going to be there for them, right? Like we want to be there for people and help them. And if that's true for our physical lives, that, that our health will impact others, how much more true is it for our spiritual lives? When you are spiritually healthy, it is going to impact the people you live with, your kids, your grandkids, or future grandkids, your friends and neighbors. Focus on your spiritual health. Prioritize your spiritual health. The second message this letter has for us is that we should work together for the truth. John said Gaius was doing well at this in verses 5 through 8. He said that some brothers and sisters had come to Gaius' town, and it seems like they were some kind of traveling missionary group, maybe kind of like we read about in the New Testament, where like Paul left with Barnabas and Mark, and they're traveling around like a group of three of them. And from Paul's letters, we can see sometimes his group was bigger and he had more working associates going with him. So some kind of group like that, we don't know anything really about them. And Gaius didn't know anything about them except for he was able to tell that they were believers, that they had good intentions, they were doing good work, and that they needed help. And so... I'm guessing he took them into his house and showed them hospitality because um, they needed a place to stay. And John says, good work. That was great. Keep that up. We ought to show hospitality to people like that because we want to work together for the truth. And I love that phrase, work together. And it's something we want to be all about here at Discovery. The Capital C Church is a group of project. We're a team. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, he said, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor, for we are co-workers in God's service. I love this idea because it means I get some of the credit anytime I help another believer to build the kingdom of God. Like, I might not go be a missionary with Seth Bukama, who came last week, but I can pray for him, and I can give to him, and because of that, I get some partial credit for souls saved in Thailand. God's up there keeping meticulous stats, and those count as assists, and I will take all those assists I can get. I might not plant a new church in Bremerton next year, but we can pray for Rob Steinbeck and the church Shalom Anglican, and we can give some money to him. And that counts as a gospel assist. Mm -hmm. I will take that. Assists are important, and they all matter. We might not be the one who gets the slam dunk, but we can serve it up for somebody else. And God says that we will all be rewarded according to our labor, no matter if we're the one planting or the one watering. We're the one harvesting. We're all co-workers. We work as a team. Do you guys, uh, I, I don't know if any of you follow the NBA. I certainly don't. It's a little too much uh, showboating for my taste. Although I like other sports with plenty of showboating. But anyways, uh, in the NBA, can, do you know who the player is who has the most assists of all time? 
if anybody knows, this is your chance to oppress us all with your Jeopardy knowledge. Let me Google it real quick. The, the most, yeah, you can Google it pretty fast. The most assists of all time was John Stockton. And I don't know many basketball players, but I remember his name because when I was growing up, John Stockton played for the Utah Jazz, and it seemed like every time the Seattle Sonics got into the playoffs, they would be eliminated by the Utah Jazz. Uh, there was this power team of John Stockton and Carl Malone, and John Stockton played for the Utah Jazz all 19 seasons. He would serve it up to Carl Malone, and all 19 seasons that John Stockton played, the Utah Jazz made it into the playoffs. And they made it to the championship twice and lost to the Chicago Bulls. Because <laughs> everybody lost to the Chicago Bulls <laughs> in the 90s. Uh, but John Stockton, he's from uh, Spokane. He went to Gonzaga University. And I want to be a spiritual John Stockton. Okay, I might not get many slam dunks in my life. I want to be a team player, though. You, you might argue that John Stockton was the ultimate team player in basketball because he has the most assists. And we want to work together and have that same kind of mentality for the kingdom of God here in Bremerton and all over the world. We want to partner with people. And that's what John is commending to us here is to work with people, to, to be good teammates for the kingdom. Sometimes those opportunities will just find you like they did Gaius, but... I think we also have to be discerning about who we partner with. Uh, we shouldn't just help anyone. okay? Because after all, last week we read, John said, If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. So there's groups and some people we should partner with and people that we shouldn't partner with. And we get both messages in 2 John and in 3 John here. Don't show hospitality to these people, but show hospitality to these people. And the difference is, is if they're working for the kingdom of God. If, they, uh, if what they teach aligns with the truth, and if they have good intentions. There are some people we shouldn't work together with, and some people we should. Who can you partner with for the gospel? Or who do you partner with? Who do you work together for the truth with? I got my own um, people and ministries that I, I personally partner with and some that I don't and some that I think are more important than others. And I've got a list this morning. I, I wanted to share this. Uh, I think I, I'd go even further from John from saying that there's some we should partner with and some we shouldn't. I'd say there are even more and less valuable ministries we can partner with. And I want to give you my list this morning and maybe uh, challenge, challenge your list. The top of my list would be people who are actively focused on sharing the gospel. And that would include church plants and missionaries who agree with the essentials of Christian teaching. Second on my list of uh, most valuable ministries to help would be Christian ministries who do good things in our world and who do them in Jesus' name. Groups like Olive Crest that we heard from a few weeks ago, Teen Reach Adventure Camp here in Bremerton, World Vision, Convoy of Hope, St. Vincent de Paul, and many more. They're, they help people with practical needs. They are the hands and feet of Jesus in our world, and they do it in Jesus' name. But I want you to notice, like I, I really value some of those ministries I just named, but I'd still put them at number two. Most important need people have is Jesus. Okay. Jesus also calls us to do good things, so I, I put this as number two. But I like them because they also point people towards their greatest need. It's like, here's, here's a sandwich. Can I pray with you? You know, here, or here is a, <clears throat> here's a, a home for you to be adopted in, and it's a Christian home. Um, anyways, we want to support those. And then third on my list would be humanitarian organizations that help people, but not in the name of Jesus, necessarily. And that would be things like the American Red Cross, United Way, Goodwill. Like, they do good things, and as Christians, 
how can we not care about every need people have? Um, but I would still put them third because every human's greatest need is for God. And so more like even though I would help some of these third rate organizations, I would prefer the second group. And even more than that, I'd prefer the first group. I'm just throwing that out there as my own list. And I think John would agree with me and the Bible would agree with me. But this could be up for, you know, what the Holy Spirit puts on your heart as well. I do have one pet peeve um, I'll, I'll mention, which is goodwill. Uh, I don't know much about them except for their slogan. It says, doing the most good. And every time I see that, I think... No, you're not. The most good is telling people about Jesus, not giving them used socks. For $20. Used socks are better. Yeah, for twenty dollars. <laughs> used socks are better than no socks, and I think Goodwill does a lot of good. But um, I'm just going to pick on them and say they're not doing the most good. The most good is any time we can tell somebody about Jesus. So John recommended that Gaius. Continue to help this group of brothers and sisters because what they did was for the sake of the name. That was the, the phrase John used. So yes, if God puts it on your heart to give with to Doctors Without Borders or the Humane Society, go for it. But even better, I'd say, is to support people and ministries who work for the sake of the name. In the next couple verses, we get a negative example. Uh, Diotrephes is an example of what it looks like to not work together for the truth. Scholars say that we don't know much about Diotrephes, but I feel like I know exactly who he was. In fact, I feel like I've met him. Um, Diotrephes is any church leader who is in it for the wrong reasons. Narcissistic church Leaders. He, he loves being in charge. He has a deep need for everyone to respect him. He's been given a vision from God about what his church should do. And if everyone else would just fall in line, everything would be fine. He's been somehow given authority over the church. And he feels like it's his job to protect that authority at all costs. Even if it means playing some political games and stretching the truth a little bit. What bugs Diotrephes the most is other churches or other leaders getting mixed up with his people or his area of the city. He's protective about his sheep, and he is sick of sheep-stealing pastors who come in and seduce his people over to their side. So he keeps a tight rein on his church. After all, it's all he's got to make himself feel valued and important. I hope and pray that we never become a Diotrephes type of church. Our hope and prayer is that we will be a source of help and encouragement and prayer for other Christians, churches, ministries, and missionaries in Bremerton and beyond. Because the church is God's, its people are God's, and God has called us to work together for the truth. The third message this letter has for us is do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Gaius apparently would have his hands full with this Diotrephes guy. Uh, so John even said, I'll, I'll come and put him in his place when I come in person. But in the meantime, John wanted to write to Gaius and said, hold tight to your integrity in this situation. Diotrephes wasn't afraid to play dirty. Have you ever been in a situation some drama maybe with your family or your work or a friend group where some people play dirty and they spread rumors or gossip, maneuver the social situation. It's tempting when you know you're right to stoop to that level and, and play in the mud. And I would, <coughs> the, the, the last message of Third John is just during those times, we need to be reminded to not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The ends don't justify the means. If you find out someone at work has lied about you, that doesn't give you permission to lie about them. 
someone gossips about you, it doesn't give you permission to gossip about them. If someone in your family is rude to you, that doesn't make it acceptable for you to be rude back. In difficult times, hold tight to your integrity. It's the hardest time and the most important time. And you want, the ideal situation is even when people do you dirty, that they would be able to, if, if they were gonna speak honestly, that they could say that you did everything right. Even if you, they don't agree with you, or even if they don't like you, I think a great compliment is that if they could say, you know, I didn't agree with them, I don't like them, but I've got to admit, they didn't do anything wrong. And, uh, and they treated me with respect during the whole process. And even if they lie about you, remember, the most important thing isn't that you're spoken of well by others. The most important thing is that you are well spoken of by the truth. And that's a phrase John uses. He says that his, uh, his friend was spoken of well by the truth. Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone and even by the truth itself. In trying times, hold tight to your integrity. Do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Be above reproach. I've got three next steps for us to consider from 3 John. The first one is I will prioritize my spiritual health. So if there's some way you could think of, you could focus on your spiritual health this week. I encourage you to take that little baby step. In a lot of health situations, they encourage you to just take take a little step towards being healthy. And I would say the same thing for our spiritual health. Maybe you want to take a small spiritual step towards God this week by cracking open your Bible or praying before meals or, um, or having a conversation with somebody about God. Take that step. Focus on your spiritual health. It's the most important thing you can focus on in your whole life. It's to be spiritually healthy because your soul is going to last longer than your body. So focus on your spiritual health. A second next step is I will work together for the truth. Get a spiritual assist to add to your stats. If there's some way you could partner with somebody, maybe it's somebody in our church, uh, somebody in our community or a ministry, I just want to encourage all of that. You know, you can't partner with everybody. There's a whole lot of people out there doing good and a lot of groups out there that do good, but... Um, whatever's in front of you, whatever God puts on your heart, keep that up. Good job for whatever you're doing, and, and keep it up. Pray for him. Give money. Go volunteer. Work together. God loves it when he sees us working together as a team. And the last next step is, I won't imitate what is evil, but what is good. And I'm just... I just want to say that. It's the same words John had to any of you who are going through something difficult. And you can count on this, that if you're in any kind of social problem with unbelievers, the chances are high that they're going to play dirty, that they're going to lie about you, that they're going to have an attitude that is less than stellar. Okay, and, and they're going to do things that aren't right. And if you're in that situation, I, I want to pray for you, and I want to encourage you, and, and I want to tell you what John said. Don't imitate that. Whatever they're doing, don't do that. Paul said that we can be kind and loving to other people, and, and in so doing, we heap burning coals on their head. I think that was Paul's way of, uh, of <laughs> kind of encouraging us because when people do us dirty, we want to, we have a sense of justice. It's like we want to get them back. And, and Paul says, no, let God pay him back. Because that sense of justice we have is right, but we shouldn't take it into our own hands. We should do everything as, as righteously as possible. And even when we show love to them, you can heap burning coals on their head 
it's a weird thing, and I'm not sure exactly what Paul was trying to do there. It almost sounds like he was saying, yeah, you can get them back. Here's how you can get them back is by loving them, all right, and doing the right thing. And that should make us feel good in this situation. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this short letter of 3 John that was written not just to Gaius, but for our benefit as well. And I pray that you'd help us take all these little encouragements to heart. Help us to prioritize our spiritual health. Help us to work together with other believers for the sake of the truth, for your name, Jesus. Help us to be good teammates and coworkers, whatever that means. And then, Lord, help us to never repay evil with evil, but to overcome evil with good. Help us to maintain our integrity in the hardest of situations. Amen. Amen. We are going to close with um, a, a short time of prayer. So in just a moment, we'll put on some music and we're going to pray for one another. But first, I'd like to ask the hosts to get ready to pass the baskets. Uh, if you filled out a connection card, now would be the time to put it in the baskets. And if you came prepared to give this morning, you can drop that in the baskets or in the deposit box by the door. Or you can give online at discoverybremerton.com. Hosts, you can go ahead and pass the baskets. And, uh, and we're going to put some music on now and pray. And you can pray by yourself or, even better, pray with somebody else. Pray with somebody that you're sitting with. Pray with somebody that you love praying with. Or pray with somebody you've never prayed with before. You can take a moment if you want to and, and share anything that is on your hearts or anything God's been speaking to you. Maybe you have a difficult situation at work or with family and you want to pray that God would help you hold tight to your integrity and do the right thing in this situation. Or you want to pray for your own spiritual health and, and have somebody pray with you for that. Um, whatever it is, let's go ahead and, uh, and pray for one another. And then after we've prayed for a little while, Ben will come up and, and lead us in one final song together. Go ahead and find somebody to pray with and let's pray for one another. Thank <laughs> you. 
Stand together for one last song and we worship God.